Our next presenter is Michael McMillan. Michael McMillan co-founded Atlantis Films Limited in 1978. In its early years, Atlantis was primarily a film and television production house, winning an Oscar in 1984 for its short film, Boys and Girls, and an Emmy in 1992 for Lost in the Barrens, amongst other awards. In 1993, Atlantis became a broadcaster with the launch of its first network, Life Network. In 1998, Atlantis acquired Atlantis Communications in a reverse takeover, and the company became Alliance Atlantis Communications. Under Michael's continued leadership as chairman and CEO, the company operated 13 Canadian television networks, including HGTV Canada, Showcase Television, History Television, and my favorite, the Food Network. <laughs> Can you tell? The company also distributed and produced movies and television programs, including the hit series CSI Crime Scene Investigation. And in 2007, Michael retired from Alliance Atlantis after selling the company to CanWest Communications and Golden Sachs. In 2007, Michael co-founded Samara, which is a charity that works to strengthen and improve the state of Canadian politics. Michael is the chair of Samara. Michael's co-founder and co-owner of Clausen Chase Vineyards and Winery in Prince Edward County, Ontario. It makes Chardonnay and Pinot Noir wines. In 2011, Michael co-founded and is CEO of Blue Ant Media, a new Canadian media company. Blue Ant owns eight Canadian specialty television channels, as well as digital media properties and magazines, including Cottage Life. Michael has volunteered with numerous community and industry organizations over many years and is currently involved with Open Roofs, Human Rights, uh, civics and the Community Food Centers Canada, amongst other things. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Michael. He's going to be speaking about his book, which I've not read yet, but is in the back seat of my car as we speak. It's called Tragedy in the Commons. So, Michael, if I could have you come up. Thank you very much. Good morning. A perky audio. That's great. Uh, so I'm not really talking about the main theme of your gathering this weekend. I'm, I guess I'm the, and now for something completely different uh, segment. I'll just talk for a moment or two about Samara, which is, uh, and, and then I'll talk about the a specific research project that my colleagues and I undertook. And um, I, I guess I'm not totally uh, something completely different in the sense that I'm talking about parliamentarians today and you folks are very interested in how parliamentarians make laws or don't make laws and how they how they uh, pursue our, our common good. The Samara is a nonpartisan organization that I co-founded about five or so years ago. Uh, I co-founded it with a woman a uh, generation younger than me, Alison Lote. And although she's a lot younger, she shares the same really old-fashioned, out-of-date idea that public leadership matters. And our idea is that we're trying to reconnect Canadian citizens back to civil society, political leadership, and political engagement. That means far more than just voting once every four years. Samara, the word Samara, is derived from that winged helicopter seed that comes to the ground from the maple tree. That double-winged helicopter seed is called a Samara. So the conceit there is it's a symbol of Canada, but also from small seeds, bigger ideas grow, much like the environmental movement over the past four decades. Samara, you can learn more about it if you're interested, SamaraCanada.com. Our website is there. We're a charity. We exist only from the donations that we receive. My aha moment for wanting to start Samara, and my background was in film and TV and media for, for decades, but I discovered, and I've told this story a number of times, but I think you folks might find some resonance with it. I realized about five or six years ago that I was losing even more dinner party debates or arguments. And it wasn't that I cared about losing the arguments. It was worse than that. My otherwise intelligent friends would say, Mike, why are you going on and on about that? You know, you're gnarling on about this political thing or that thing, and just shut up. It, it doesn't make any difference. Whatever you say, whatever you do, will have no impact. You know, it's the old don't vote, it only encourages them school of thought. 
And they would say, Mike, all you have to do is just make sure you've got your own pile of acorns sufficient to get you through the winter, you and your friends or your family on your own, and if you do and she does and she does and he does, you'll all be okay in the most tortured, absurd rewording of Adam Smith. But I couldn't, I could not disagree more with the position. At Samara, we're not uh, dealing with any particular uh, policy matter, so we're not about environmental change, we're not about immigration, we're not about taxation. We're trying to take a, a, a broader approach to how we come to make decisions and how we participate or how we don't participate in general. We do a variety of research-based projects and we run educational programs. Uh, I won't talk about them, I'm going to talk about one thing specifically now for the next uh, half hour or so, and that is uh, the, our MP exit interview project. As m most of you would know, in the private sector, when a senior executive uh, leaves, retires, uh, one tries to do an exit interview with that person, and you can find a lot of interesting stuff, things that they often never felt comfortable talking about while they were in your employ. We haven't done that uh, in Canada, um, unlike in the private sector. And, but my colleagues and I undertook what we believe to be the first ever systematic series of exit interviews of federal parliamentarians in Canada. We did a, published a number of reports uh, based on those interviews and uh, after them, a Random House, the publisher, approached us and said you could uh, work that up and ex extrapolate it and turn it into a book, which we did, and the book is called Tragedy in the Commons. Obviously, the title of the book kind of gives away the punchline, too, I suppose. But I'll tell you how we did these. These were 80 interviews. They were two or three hours each. Uh, Allison and I traveled across the country and met with each of these former parliamentarians in their living room or in the local cafe or restaurant or their office, but somewhere we visited them in their natural habitat, so to speak. <laughs> These were all in the class of 06 and 08 and a few who left in 2011. It was all on the record. We had a little tape recorder, which they quickly forgot about, uh, but it was all recorded with their permission. They were completely uh, reflective uh, of uh, the country. 35 of them uh, had been cabinet ministers of, of the 80. We were introduced to them through the Canadian Association of Former Parliamentarians that you didn't know there was an organization called that, but there is. So they did provide us some, some good auspices to, uh, to be introduced to them. What happened next really surprised us. First of all, almost all of them that we asked agreed to be interviewed. That was shocking. A number of them, when we asked them why they said yes, a number said, well, nobody's ever talked to me since I ceased being a parliamentarian. Their reluctance at the beginning of the interviews, and they would lean forward even more hunched forward than I am now, generally changed over the two or three hours of the interview. And by the end of it, they were leaning backwards, their back, their feet were up on you know, the chair nearby. They were pouring more coffee, and we were looking at our watches saying, gosh, it's time to go. So they really did get, get into it. But that, that's not even the real surprising part. The really surprising part is that they basically all, or virtually all, agreed with each other. We had kind of assumed that the bloc would say one thing and the NDP would say another and the Liberals this and the Tories that, that they would give us responses fundamentally along party lines, but that is not at all what happened. Now there were some outliers, there were some, um, and I'm not going to really talk about them that much in, in this presentation to you, so it's not, I don't mean to say that every single MP agreed on every single thing, but there were overwhelming uh, a basis of agreement on all the big topics that they discussed. The, but the next most surprising thing is the important things that they wanted to emphasize to us, this is 80, 80 times, weren't, were not the topics that Allison and I brought up in the first place. So they agreed, regardless of party, they went out of their way, not to answer the questions we're asking them, but to talk about their favorite other topics, which I'll talk to you about in a moment or two. We took what these former parliamentarians said with a grain of salt. If you happen to read the book at some point, you'll discover that it's not as if we believed every word they said. 
we approach this as documentarians, and when you hear the same thing over and over again, and they clearly want you to know this, whether you believe it or not isn't the point. The real point is, what are they trying to get across? What, what is the meaning that they are wanting to convey in that assertion that happens over and over? So who were these people? Well, of the 80, 64 were men and 16 were women. 35 were cabinet ministers. The balance were backbenchers. They served on average 10 and a half years in, in uh, public life in Ottawa. On average, they began their career as an MP at age 49. So they'd had probably a quarter century of work in something else before coming to Ottawa. They had varied backgrounds. 12% only were lawyers. The largest single group is what I call the caring professions, nurses, doctors, firefighters, police officers, that kind of thing. But there's no real overwhelming uh, professional category, uh, and they really did reflect the country. And they also reflected the makeup of the House of Commons. They were very indicative. They included backbenchers who you may never have heard of, but they also included uh, well-known uh, parliamentarians like Chuck Stroll, Monty Solberg, Jay Hill, Bill Graham, Paul Martin, Ann McClellan, Ed Broadbent, Peter Milliken, Gary Morasti, and so on. So to begin with, we asked them a really a fluffball, an easy question. How did you get into politics in the first place? What brought you to public life? What did you want to accomplish? And right off the bat, they began to talk about two themes that ran through the interviews, that ran through our reports, and that runs through the book, and that will run through the remaining um, remarks that I've got for you today. But actually, before I get into that, uh, because the, um, the main themes are not all that charming, uh, it is worth saying that these 80 interviews were merely a snapshot. They were a moment in time. And if one went out after this next election, if there's an election next year, uh, uh, and interviewed uh, recently um, graduated MPs, they may have a whole different story. So we know that as documentarians, it's a snapshot and a moment in time. Also, uh, even though I'm going to paint a pretty negative picture, it wasn't all bad. They all spoke about the sense of awe and responsibility they felt as parliamentarians. We asked them at the end of the interviews if they hoped their kids might one time serve uh, in public office or be a, a public servant. And almost all of them said, yes, that would be great. If there were some way for my kid or my kids to somehow participate in public life in this country, I think that would be terrific. And they all felt that they did accomplish something. So it, it's not all bad. Uh, however, let's get on with the bad stuff, because that is, the, unfortunately, the main thing. So the first thing that they stressed to us is that they never wanted to be a parliamentarian. They were dragged kicking and screaming into it. They were asked repeatedly to run. They said, no thanks, no thanks. And it was only after they were asked over and over again that they finally agree reluctantly to enter the political sphere. They, just, they defined themselves as, a, actually, on, on that score, I see a couple of people, their eyebrows, they're wrinkling their foreheads here. Everything's on the record uh, in the book, but in the front of the book, sort of before the introduction, at, at the introduction, we have a little quote, which we reveal who said it a few pages later. But this MP says, um, uh, playing football and hockey is more important to me. The question was, how do you get interested in public life, basically? I never had an interest in going into politics. I never had an interest in going into politics. I was going to go to the third world. That was my ultimate aim. I wanted to make money before I went. And suddenly, uh, very, very late in life, uh, a friend was active and came to try to see me to convince me to run. So this is the same story that we got over and over again. That was Paul Martin saying that. A fellow who was brought up in a very political household. Uh, even he said that he never had any intention of running, never thought about it until middle age. They also defined themselves as outsiders. That outsider moniker differed. Uh, one said, I'm the first uh, woman of Greek heritage who's ever served in the House of Commons. Uh, Don Boudria said, I'm the only person whose first job on Parliament Hill was washing dishes in the uh, parliamentary cafeteria, sort of an upstairs, downstairs kind of outsiders. Uh, the Bloc uh, said they wanted to be outsiders. 
and the reformers uh, said that they were, you know, the West wants in sort of thing. So there's a wide range of definition of what an outsider meant. But the weird part was that these people who said they uh, never wanted to uh, be a politician and they were outsiders, actually almost all of them had long successful careers as leaders in their communities. They've been volunteers, they've successfully done a lot of things in their community, which is no doubt how, how they were kind of noticed by their, by their confrères and asked to run. So Allison and I didn't really believe uh, this outsider. Uh, I was forced to do it. We came to call this the creation myth. And many religions and societies have a creation myth. You know, we may not, and Christians may not exactly 100% believe that Adam and Eve were there in the Garden of Eden and the apple and all that, but what a creation myth says about a religion or society tells volumes beyond the specific metaphor or the specific words in that story. And we think maybe you can extrapolate that also from our parliamentarians' creation myth. The other thing is that they claimed to be not like all their other political colleagues. They said, I'm not a real pol I'm not one of those politicians. I'm an anti politicians, an anti politician. And this anti politician shtick ran through the whole interview and runs through the book. And we found it, frankly, really disturbing that apparently, even in hindsight, one cannot admit ambition for political leadership in this country. And we know why that must be, because they're not stupid. They know in what bad odor politicians are, are held, and they don't want to be associated with it. Well, when Coke competes with Pepsi, it says, buy Coke, it tastes better than Pepsi. Or make the, when McDonald's competes against Burger King, they make the same arguments for their product. They don't diss the whole category of soft drinks or hot dogs or hamburgers or whatever. So if our public leaders so resoundingly diss politicians, why are we surprised when the public holds similar views? Why are we surprised when only 2% of Canadians belong to a political party? Why are we surprised when voter turnout is on a slow uh, decline over the past 50 years? I don't know. If I'm on the gurney going into the operating room for open heart surgery, I kind of want my heart surgeon to say, yeah, I wanted to be a doctor. I'm here on purpose. I like doing it, and I care about it. Or my tax accountant is trying to figure out how to make my, my numbers add up. I, I want him or her to say, yeah, I went to school, and I'm happy to be here. It's absolutely ridiculous that public leadership in this country has to kind of hide. It's like you go to a Maple Leaf hockey game, <laughs> sadly, uh, and there are still fans who are at the game with paper bags over their heads. It's a long-standing joke, but they're pretending not to be there, not unlike former, par former parliamentarians and current ones who pretend not to be there. The second theme that ran through our interviews these 80 former MPs said that the biggest concern or distaste that they had in their political careers was dealing with the leadership of their own political party. They didn't mean the specific individual who was the head of the party per se. It was some sort of ill-defined group of either elected officials or backroom boys and girls, by both, who were somehow seven feet closer to the real levers of power than they were. But they talked about their career as an MP being managed or dominated by their political party, success or, fa or failure based on how they were able to navigate the shoals and, and the, the um, well, yeah, I guess the shoals of, of their own party. They began by complaining about the nomination process. They talked a lot about their nomination process. Um, in the book, they use words like opaque, vague, confusing, fraudulent. These are the winners speaking. Really shocking, considering that in Canada, in many, many ridings, the nomination process is, process is actually a real election. 
I mean, the nomination process for a Tory candidate in Alberta kind of is the election. Federally, the nomination process for a Liberal in, in central Toronto kind of is the election. And parties and MPs kind of come in and out on tides of change, you know, uh, great, great groups at once, including, you know, the NDP uh, in Quebec ridings in the last federal election. In those cases, you know, the, the real election was in the nomination process. They also complained about the lack of orientation when they got to Ottawa, and this was quite surprising to us. When they got to Ottawa, they said there was no uh, orientation or explaining. By orientation, I don't mean where's the washroom and how do you fill out an expense form, not, not that kind of trivial stuff. But how does uh, Ottawa, how does Parliament work? How are bills crafted and passed? How do committees work? How does a caucus work? How can they participate? There was very little explanation of how that would be. And some of them mentioned that uh, they asked for help from their caucus friends in their own caucus. They were given uh, backwards and upside down information because they felt that their caucus colleagues didn't want them to get ahead uh, as their own uh, party mates. They complained bitterly about whipped votes, about being told how to vote in the House. Um, those complaints came from uh, uh, you know, across the range, but they were most clearly uh, articulated by the former Repo Reform and Alliance MPs who became uh, Conservative MPs, but it was across the board, but they, they said it most uh, clearly. They complained about decisions at the centre of their party, vague, opaque, unclear on how policy decisions were made, how committee appointments were made, uh, and how additional responsibilities in the party uh, would be uh, allocated. They complained uh, uh, quite loudly about what they call forced bad behavior, especially in question period, but not just in question period, but being given uh, talking notes or speaking notes and being limited in what they could say, and especially being told to get up and behave like uh, kindergartners. They told us that committee work was the good work, where real work got done. They had some really uh, compelling stories, but they said that the committee work turned into uh, uh, a negative territory when the lights and the cameras were turned on. And certainly my experience appearing before uh, committees in Ottawa over the years has been uh, when they are filmed. It's, it's not so charming. But Allison and I were thinking, this is kind of funny. They want us to know that the good work is someplace where we can't see it. They just criticized all the stuff that we can see. They tell us the good stuff is happening behind closed doors. And in any event, you know, in my life, I try to do, save my bad behavior for when nobody can see it. And I try to be well behaved when I'm here right now, for example. Why would it be in political life that apparently the good behavior is quiet behind, you know, when nobody's looking and just the opposite? Something doesn't entirely ring true with that. These 80 former MPs talked to us as if politics was something that happened to them. They displayed a remarkable passivity to what was going on. These were highly accomplished men and women who had a career for 25 years, who'd been active in their home communities or their province or the city, whatever it was, highly accomplished with a great sense of individual agency that somehow seemed to be sort of institutionalized upon arriving on Parliament Hill. And they were often were described uh, in the interviews uh, things as if they weren't there and as if it weren't really happening to them and if they weren't an active part of it. So the question, of course, in our minds and, and probably yours is, well, if that's what it was like, if they didn't like it, if it was so bad, why are they only complaining about it now? And why didn't they do something about it back then? A. Hill, who was uh, a, a Reform Alliance uh, Conservative uh, MP for many years, uh, a government house leader, very, very uh, uh, experienced, long-serving MP, uh, quite eloquently in, in the book, uh, just urges the MPs to get a backbone. He takes about two pages to say it, but uh, that's his uh, uh, sort of admonition for them. The question is, why didn't they grow a backbone, and why did Jay Hill, when he was House Leader, 
uh, participate in some of those histrionics. The only complaining about it after the fact. That's probably a, a complex uh, group of factors. They're probably psychological, they're sociological, they're no doubt you know, political uh, and practical. But we come to Alice and I come to think that one of the key factors is the role and the structure of the political party in Canada. The political party doesn't does not appear, does not is not mentioned in our constitution. The political parties are an invention off on the side, even though they play a front and center role uh, in our in our life together. The party's role and function have evolved uh, over time, and now we would argue uh, we have one of the most centralized power systems of any Western democracy, and certainly of any Westminster-style democracy. Various things have contributed to this. We would point our finger, and a couple of the MPs did, at in 1970, we changed the Elections Act. And some of you will recall, prior to 1970, when we voted, we voted for Sally Smith, comma, engineer, or Hugh Jenkins, comma, you know, farmer. You had the profession on the ballot, but not the party name. The party names only appeared on the ba ballot beginning in the 1972 election. That was also the first election uh, where the 1970 Elections Act change occurred, whereby the right to nominate a candidate was removed from the local riding and transferred to the party leadership. And both those changes were made to remove the right to nominate and put it into the party central and to put the, the party name on the ballot in order to give a full tax deduction for donations uh, to the party. The, the concept being if the public purse is going to subsidize a tax receipt to a, a donor, then the party wants to know who's who and are they really on their team or not. But it's had a profound, profound impact on the relationship between the party and the MPs or the nominees. Uh, in, back in the old days, you would argue the local riding association and voters hired the nominee or hired the MP, and the MPs hired the leader. They chose the leader. Well, it happens the exact opposite way now. It's relevant because when we asked these former MPs, if you didn't like it, why didn't you do anything about it, they would tell us we couldn't because if we didn't toe the line, we'd find ourselves taken off that committee maybe not have our papers signed for the next uh, nomination uh, and certainly we wouldn't you know, advance our, our political career so it was best basically uh, to shut up. So it's a really tough question. Who is going to be the first MP in a party to refuse those toxic speaking points? Who is going to be the first to vote as she or he knows how his or her constituents wants or how she or he feels best? or to risk not climbing the ladder. Which will be the first party to change its behavior, be the first party to put down its weapons first? I was discussing this a few months ago with a current parliamentarian in Ottawa, and she said to me, Mike, we can't make those changes. Don't you understand? It's a goddamned knife fight, and we can't put down our, knife, our knives first. Keith Martin, who was a uh, Alliance uh, Conservative then a Reform uh, MP, uh, had a quote in our book, and he says that the tragedy of Canadian politics is that long-term value is all too often sacrificed at the altar of short-term gain. And that brings us to the title of the book, Tragedy in the Commons. Obviously, that may, refers to the House of Commons, but specifically, it's a play on the 1968 essay by Garrett Hardin. In 68, Hardin wrote an essay published in Science, and it was called Tragedy of the Commons. And in his essay, he was a biologist, uh, but in his essay, he gave the metaphor of a village green, a patch of grazing land sufficient in this village to, let's say, house or, or, or uh, maintain 100 sheep. So 100 farmers, 100 sheep, each one sheep on the village green and life was good. Well, it wouldn't take a, a rocket scientist or a sheep farmer, I guess, to figure out that if you had a second sheep, you could put the second sheep on that village green, enjoy all the benefit of having two sheep being fed, 
and only 1% of the damage. Well, if everybody put a second sheep on the village green, there'd be no grass left for any sheep to nibble, and all would uh, end up in a, in a very, very, very bad outcome. This is the metaphor and the issue for common resources and shared resources uh, in a complex world. Uh, it's, in fact, a metaphor highly applicable uh, to the environmental movement. Uh, it's uh, why there still are people out there in that 8% dismissal, dismissive category that we heard about a few minutes ago. Uh, so the tragedy uh, in the Commons, based on the Garrett Hardin book about how do we cope with dealing with shared common resources, who will be the first to act for the larger public good in the longer term? So the topics raised by the uh, 80 former MPs are not terribly surprising. What is surprising, because it's probably what, what you folks thought uh, uh, about members of parliament or politicians, but what was surprising was the consistency with which they raised these points, that there were 80 former MPs from all political parties. The response to our book in the past few months from current and former MPs and MPPs and mayors has been overwhelmingly positive. Unsolicited emails and letters from various uh, elected leaders saying, yeah, those 80 former MPs, they, they kind of got it roughly right. That's, that's more or less what I felt. The response from political uh, volunteers or political oper senior political operators in the Canadian political parties has been what I've come to call more nuanced than that, which means some of them said, yeah, that's roughly correct, but uh, more of them have said, are you crazy? You and Allison are just dupes to imagine, to believe what these people told you. They're just a grumpy, upset former MPs who are pissed at the fact that they never got enough personal power themselves. And you can't let members of parliament say what they actually think. We'll have bloody chaos. And, of course, that attitude is precisely the frustration and the attitude against which these folks were rebelling and commenting when they were telling us about how frustra frustrated they were with the leadership of their own party. Uh, but we, weren't, we, we don't say that uh, we should, and the MPs were not telling us to disband political parties. I mean, political parties are hugely important. How else would we develop policy, contest elections, recruit candidates? How else could we possibly have any kind of coherence and get anything done uh, politically? They're, they perform vital roles in our democracy, and that's precisely why the topic matters. Because they're so important, we might want to consider what kind of reforms we could apply to political parties to address what these MPs told us. We asked the MPs how to fix things. By and large, their answers were thin and scattered, fortunately. Uh, but we've uh, teased out of those a few suggestions and, and, um, and have a few of our own. Some suggestions would include why not oblige Canadian political parties, or at least those who want to give a tax receipt for donations, that like major advertisers, they should adhere, be members of the Canadian uh, Advertising Standards Council. That's a series of rules around advertising that make it illegal, for example, to put out uh, defamatory uh, uh, advertising. It seems simple. Why shouldn't they be held to that? level of, of account uh, that companies are. You can sign them up for that. Why not oblige Canadian political parties to have financial disclosure akin to what we require for Canadian publicly traded companies on a stock exchange? Why not oblige parties to post information on how a nominee will be selected in their riding? We did a survey two years ago of about 1,300 Canadian uh, uh, websites for lo local parties and local writings, writing associations, about 1,300, about four and a half per, per riding across the country. Less than 1% had any information posted about uh, how to be a member, and less than 5% any information on the process uh, to select the next candidate. So one could oblige some form of information to be made public. One could be, um, we do find, uh, take, take some positive uh, hope in the effort that uh, Michael Chong, a Conservative MP, has put forward his Reform Act. 
I personally find it pretty weird that the, uh, well it's not weird at all, I get it, but that the NDP and the Liberal uh, parties uh, did nothing to support his initiative and it was only after it's been severely watered down in recent weeks that they're now uh, giving it its backing. It's still a useful contribution even though it's been watered down, uh, but that got at the, or is attempting to get at the heart of the relationship between individual MPs and their party leadership. These are not changes that require change in the Constitution. These are not changes that are all that hard and they might in some minor way uh, change some of the relationship between parties and those who are supposed to represent us uh, in there. So those suggestions that I've just made uh, like the remarks from the MPs that we interviewed, uh, should be quite uncontroversial. But somehow, shining a light on political parties seems to get pushback from those in charge. Just like these former MPs claiming to be outsiders, when they're not really, in a way, it's an effort to distance themselves from the poor state of politics conducted by their own political party. I would say, though, that as well as wagging a finger at members of Parliament, as I guess we do in the book, and I am again right now, we might want to consider wagging a finger at ourselves. How often do we try to hold our candidates to account? How often do we ask nominees and candidates in a federal election what they are going to do about these topics? If there's an election next year, you know, it's certainly an opportunity for all of us to ask the, the nominee, ask the candidates in each of our writings uh, how they might address some of these uh, uh, issues around their role in, in the political party. So that's the uh, tragedy in the Commons. Uh, I remind you what I said at the beginning, uh, these uh, 80 uh, former MPs did speak of, with awe of the responsibility that they, they brought to Ottawa. Um, they, they really felt their role was important. Uh, many had never been on Parliament Hill before their first day uh, in their seats. Uh, some had never set foot in the city of Ottawa um, before that time. But they all came with a great sense of responsibility and virtually all of them uh, felt that they did accomplish uh, much uh, in their time here. That's a tragedy in the Commons and um, I'm happy to uh, answer questions or chat about whatever you'd like. Thank you. I uh, well, there's been no election called yet. Oh, sorry. The question was that I twice said if there's an election called next year, and um, the questioner is saying, "Why did I say if?" I think because she would be of the view that the law says we will have one. There are two parts to that question. One is, are we going to do more exit interviews uh, uh, after the election that's scheduled for next year? Uh, uh, and the, the other question was, um, did we get any feedback from our uh, former MPs about uh, electoral reform, including dealing with the first-past-the-post concept? Uh, in terms of more interviews, we may. We haven't decided yet for sure. Uh, we didn't have to really deal with it because you know it's, it's been a four-year period. But we're, we're, we're considering it. We might do it in a different way if we do. Um, I, I think that uh, with the book and that some, some of the noise that it's made, um, we might have to find a different way to, to, to come at it, not, not just be repeating ourselves. 
In terms of uh, the MB's comments of electoral reform, it was kind of thin on the ground. Uh, we asked the question. Uh, in this case, there was some difference. The NDP uh, MPs were, the, I think, the only ones to mention uh, proportional representation. They also tended to be uh, more senior former uh, NDP MPs like Alexa McDonough, Ed Broadbent, Bill Blakey, uh, but the others didn't so much. Um, and I, I, and partly that's because some of the NDP MPs, when it came to the topic of party control, and I'm, and I'm overstating it when I say this, but would say, look, you know, you, you knew why you were elected. You were elected as a member of a party, so suck it up and vote with the party. You know, you know what the platform is, and just do it. They were pretty clear about that. Uh, but some others raised the concern around proportional representation. That and there's about ten different versions of PR, and I know you folks all know that. But the, a sort of a simple version merely is that each party gets to nominate the number of uh, MPs that the, their percent would reflect. The problem there is that even more weakens the relationship between constituents and an MP because it's the party that has the power to run down the list and say we're going to put so and so and so and so and so and so into Parliament, and that the party has more control over who those MPs are, where they rank on the list compared to in the current system. Somebody in theory can you know get enough support and be the nominee and be elected by those people. So. Uh, but quickly to summarize, there was way less talk about ch electoral reform changes than you would imagine. It mostly came from the uh, former NDP MPs and those other concerns that I just mentioned. If I should repeat the question, the question was, um, do they talk much about how policy got made and how uh, points of view from uh, members or the public or lobbyists were, were put into that process? Three quick things come to my mind. When I was going on a few minutes ago about some changes to uh, political parties, uh, I forgot to say that another idea, because it goes to this point, is that why not, in order for a political party to be eligible to give a tax receipt for a donation, it needs to spend at least a certain fraction of its money, or at least tell us what that fraction is, uh, of its budget annually on policy development. And you can't spend it all just on advertising. So some countries in, in, uh, in Europe have that rule, and it's quite a sensible one, actually, if policy development is, should be one of the key functions of a party. Many of these MPs uh, told us that they thought that the political, uh, sorry, the policy development capacity in their party had been weakened so much in the past 20 years that they came to rely on lobby groups. So good luck tomorrow. But, you know, but they said, you know, we don't have the capacity anymore. Uh, we we do rely and need the input from 
from citizens, from lobby groups, from organizations, from companies, from individuals, and it's way, way, way more important than you think. So that, that was interesting. And the third point, which goes to polling, there was a really interesting book written about the 1988 Canadian federal election. It was called 100 Monkeys. I forget the name of the author, but it's a really great book, 100 Monkeys, and that was the free trade debate election. And in this really compelling book, the author takes us through the changing communications technology of the time, and he says, this fax machine is a game changer. This fax machine will let parties do polling nationally, directly over the head of the Quebec lieutenant or the Alberta lieutenant or riding associations or provincial groups, and certainly over the head of the MPs, and also receive information back um, and, and disseminate it both ways, and therefore disintermediate the party apparatus at a provincial or a riding level. You know, I, I often thought since reading that book, boy, if the fax machine was doing that, what about this internet thing, you know? Uh, but he was observing that policy development uh, was able, and way, way, way now more with email and internet and social media, he can do it by dis disintermediating the traditional people who have actively, uh, in, in, in times past, participated in policy development within the political party. Oh, the leaves will win for sure. Uh, absolutely, we we need uh, candidates. Uh, it's a rough road uh, to be a parliamentarian. Uh, you know, as I use the word parliamentarian, I try to at least uh, trying to find a grammar that's supportive uh, and encouraging and respects the huge responsibility that public servants and parliamentarians have. And we need to change the grammar. We need to change how we refer to the role. Uh, and, and me using the word is not going to change it. But And we need to, I think, uh, create a more respectful and inclusive culture within political parties. I mean, there's only been two Canadians who were elected as independents in the past 35 years. Tony Roman in York South and somebody in Quebec City a couple of years ago. There have been people who have left a party to sit as an independent, of course, uh, but to be elected as an independent in the first place is very, very, very rare. I mean, parties are, are so essential. Well, what's how do people get recruited to run for public office through the apparatus of a political party? I think you have to go there to find ways to make it more uh, welcoming and to try to create a culture that, you know, able people aren't terrified at the uh, the, the battering that they're going to receive. Since you did not answer the question on the able people, I suggest you do the same thing I did. I suggest you hire them as pallbearers because those guys really know how to let you down. Again, I, I, Michael, I, I want to so thank you for your, um, uh, your, your, your work honoring and uh, listening and appreciating our, our parliamentarians. I think they really do get involved in, uh, in politics because they want to make a difference and uh, they are Canadians that uh, um, deserve to be listened to and we can learn so much from them. Um, I, I just want to bring up the, the com comments around um, proportional representation. Uh, well, CCL is, is my first love, my second love is Fair Fold Canada, and um, there's, there's this really effective disinformation that's gone forward around uh, proportional representation, and uh, the, the Ontario election was a really good example of how um, the parties would become, you know, we, we'd pick that the hacks, the party hacks, would the parties would become more powerful from that, 
And so I'll just point out that uh, Fairville Canada is really encouraging us to um, have parties get behind having a, a, a royal commission uh, that would then select our a more proportional um, way forward. So, so I, I would just want to have you, um, or I, I just, in some ways, I'm speaking to this crowd because we all cheered when proportional representation came up. Check out uh, Fairville Canada, and there are ways forward with proportional representation. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I, I also heard you in Toronto with Michael Chong. Um, one of the themes that came forward seemed to be um, this very mysterious sense of powerlessness, um, if I understood you correctly, that, uh, that was uh, strongly represented in your interview um, participants. And it certainly reminded me of the uh, Tom Peters, uh, author of In Search of Excellence. Uh, if you were in corporate world at all in the 80s, he, uh, he was uh, a very popular and uh, well-read author and speaker. And he, uh, in his t one of his talks, mentioned uh, when he worked in the Pentagon as a naval intelligence officer, he said one of the guys that, that uh, got the most done was uh, a first lieutenant. He said, this guy behaved like he was an admiral. He just hadn't got his stars or whatever. They just hadn't arrived. And, and in the same story about powerlessness, he talked about a guy who came to him after a talk and he said, gee, my boss just won't let me do anything. And he said, you know, who are you, a manager, a supervisor? Well, actually, I'm the vice chairman of a Fortune 100 company, but he also felt powerlessness. Um, can you shed any or elaborate a little bit more on that, that sort of sense of powerlessness? I, there's probably much more to it than um, for sure than I'm capable of, of observing, uh, and way more than the MPs talk to us about. Um, you know, I, I do see it in corporate life uh, increasingly, uh, and it's I don't know if it's the, the an increasing number of rules and sets of responsibilities often conflicting that make people nervous from standing up and making a clear decision and saying we're we're deciding this and I need to take responsibility for it. But I'm not sure if it's connected to that or not. I think it's exacerbated in political life, and in our book we have a chapter on this, uh, sort of calling it a franchise relationship between the MP and the party. In the riding, there's only one MP, just one MP. He or she is the boss MP of, of that riding, and you you can do a, a lot of interesting things. Uh, but then when you're in Ottawa, you're like the local franchise, you know, and you're you're being told you know how which pickles and onions on the sesame seed bun to deliver, how many ounces in a milkshake or whatever. Uh, so the, the amount of autonomy is greater in the riding and less the more it gets into Ottawa and the more it gets into actually looking at legislation, which is partly why um, many of the MPs told us that the best stuff that they did was in their riding, away from Parliament Hill, away from the power of their party. They were in on the edges where they could be more you know, actively and separately involved. Alison and I found this sort of troubling because this whole idea of constituency offices is a new idea, new in the past 45 years, uh, and the idea of staff in the offices spending most of their time helping a constituent with their you know, father's um, you know, uh, veterans affairs situation or whatever it is. Uh, we don't think that's why we elect MPs. I don't think so. I think we elect MPs to uh, consider legislation, hold the government to account, pass the necessary bills to tax or to find the money to pay for these things. And um, it's kind of weird that to, in order to, it's as if they're personal service representatives of fixing things that fall through the cracks, it would be a lot better if we had a system of government where it had less cracks. But don't get me going. Thank you. I've got uh, possibly two questions. I might get to a third one, but this time we'll and then you. Um, hi, I'm Anne from Montreal. And uh, given the constraints that the MPs are feeling from their parties, do you have any advice for us as we go out tomorrow in terms of how we f frame our message, who we talk to, um, how can we be more successful? Thank you. Good question. We can raise. Uh, 
I mean, either these concerns, but whatever your concerns are about how parties or how members of parliament um, deal with their constituents, uh, you can, uh, if, if you feel this way, you can make your concerns known about um, some of the, as Paul Martin would say, the democratic deficit issues that we have. Uh, you can say that these topics matter as well, you know, as, as well as the environmental issues and the taxation issues or the other specific policy issues that, that are uh, on your top of mind. But that the idea of governance is a serious matter and that you hope, and for, for an individual candidate next election, uh, you know, talk to them about it. And, you know, obviously if enough of us talk to them about it, uh, it, it would have some effect because they are the ones encouraged by us, they being the MPs or the candidates who have the best, like, I've got no chance of having an impact, but the, the nominees or the MPs, they're the ones who have the biggest chance of having an impact on how their parties govern themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you were here at the very start. Uh, I'm David Chernushenko. I'm a city councillor here uh, in Ottawa. Uh, and um, I guess maybe for the first time I will proudly say I'm a politician. <laughs> because your, your point hit home. Uh, I was at a conference like this yesterday where I stood up and said as the elected representative in the room maybe I'll give some comments from my side but I hate to use that term politician and I shy away from it and I'm not really a politician and I guess the reality is um, from what I hear from you uh, I think I am now going to embrace that and say, yes, I am a politician. I'm proud to be. I did it on purpose. I, although a lot of people tried to force me to run, I'm the one that decided that I was going to run. And when I decided to, I decided I was going to win and that I was going to make a difference while I was here. So uh, that's, that will be a mental shift for me, and I'll see if we can start a trend um, that way. Um, your comment about constituency affairs was very interesting because 98% of my time is spent dealing with a pothole, um, the lack of consultation, um, I, I didn't know about it, it's almost all, all constituency affairs. I have three full-time staff, I wish I had 20, um, and when I talk to councillors from other cities who are part-time and have no staff, they look at me and go, you've got staff? Um, and I guess what it shows is the changing expectations. What the bureaucracy, what the public service would have been expected to do and do well, with the politician occasionally jumping in and saying, I have a constituent who tells me that their file has not been dealt with in six months, has now become, councillor, are you going to come out and shovel my sidewalk? I mean, I only exaggerate slightly because at breakfast after five centimeters of snow, I got a phone call asking me why a sidewalk hadn't been shoveled yet. Um, so it's, that's perhaps a, a bit of a view from my side. Um, there's one little trick that I try to use to counter the fact that politics um, could be the, um, put the finger in the air and what, how is the wind blowing today? You know, what's my policy on the downtown casino? I don't know. What are people telling me today? Oh, I'm against it today. And that's a real danger. You talked about the fax machine and all the rest of, if we are polling every day, then we're no longer taking a position based on our values, on what we said we were to the constituents. So a trick that I've used in my whole first term until about six months was, I don't know if I'm going to run again. And it had to be a trick in my own head, too. I, I used the word trick, but it wasn't really. I decided that I wouldn't decide that I wanted a second term as a way to keep me from making my decision based on will it get me re-elected. So having just been re-elected, I tell you, I don't know if I want a second term. Uh, and, and I suppose it's honest more, more than a trick. Sorry if I went on too long, because my question is actually, there is a whole different category perhaps, except maybe in provinces where you have political parties municipally. In provinces like Ontario where we don't, it's a very different beast. There are some similar the comments you made that I could say apply to municipal politics, but I would be really interested in knowing what the exit polls of municipal councillors and mayors uh, tell you. Is that something you're planning or is that something that somebody else should take on? Uh, we're not planning it, uh, but it's a good idea. 
I guess maybe the exit polls for Toronto municipal politics would say that uh, there's a lot of ways to bugger it up. You don't need a political party. But good, good luck. Good luck in being a, an even more conscious uh, politician. We need conscious action, and the biggest problem we have is that the, the terrible damage that lazy indifference brings, and we will all end up like that proverbial frog in the pot of water that began room temperature and slowly got hotter and hotter. It's indifference that fails to wake up the frog. Thank you. Thank you very much. A hand for our guests, please.